music, 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 technology, music, technology, music, technology. Hello, everyone. It's Heath with the Music Technology Teacher Network, www.mutechteachernet.com. And welcome to this episode of Mutech Teacher Talk. Today, I'm going to be speaking with Megan O'Connor Vince, who teaches music technology at Barnstable High School in Hyannis, Massachusetts. I first met Megan back in the winter of 2023 at the Texas Music Educators Association Conference, where I attended a session she presented on how she has integrated hip hop into her curriculum and has actually created a course uh, called Hip Hop Honors with O'Connor that actually teaches the, the history of hip hop music in America and shows her students how to create music in that genre. Megan is very active in the Massachusetts Music Educators Association uh, in the New England area and has actually uh, has had numerous articles published in the Massachusetts Journal for Music Educators. In addition, she's presented sessions all across the country on her really innovative curriculum and has actually had two units uh, published by Music First Classroom, which is one of the most uh, one of the largest and most successful uh, platforms for delivering uh, instruction digitally for uh, music educators, band, choir, orchestra, grades K through 12. So thanks for listening to the podcast, and I really hope you enjoy the conversation I'm having today with Megan O'Connor Vince. Megan, how are you? Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Heath. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm, I'm really excited to be speaking with you today. We met, I'm trying to think, was it this past year? I think we met for the first time. Yes. And it was uh, in San Antonio. Yeah, San Antonio. Yes. And um, I'd heard a lot about you, and I think we knew a lot of the same people. But when we met in San Antonio at TMEA and I actually got to attend uh, one of your sessions and about some of the stuff that you were doing, I was just like, oh, my gosh, I've got to meet her and learn more because you're doing some really – uh, interesting things. But before we dig into that, I'm jumping way ahead of myself. So just here at the beginning of the podcast, to start off, I just like to find out from people kind of like where, what's your musical background? Did you come from a musical family when you were a kid? Like, how did you, how did you first realize that you were really interested in music? So my father, I really talk a lot about my dad in terms of my musical influence. Although my parents are not musicians, um, my father was one of those people that always had to have music in the house, like always. So, and he had such a great variety of, um, you know, different music tastes. So, you know, we'd listen to classic rock, we'd listen to blues and jazz, and then he'd even, you know, throw some pop in there. Um, so for me, that was really a big uh, kind of component of, you know, I want to do that, you know, um, listen to a lot of Dave Matthews band. And that's kind of where I had one of my first influences with uh, Barry Sachs, because that's my like primary instrument. Um, so I, you know, listening to Leroy, um, on Barry and Dave Matthews band, Leroy Moore. And, uh, yeah, I just kind of like took it from there. I picked up the saxophone in fifth grade and haven't looked back since. So, yeah. Yeah. I can relate to that a lot because my family or ne neither of my parents were, musicians but the the house was always full of music and yeah for me I, i'm a little older i think than you are but <laughs> um yeah for me it was bruce springsteen's band and his saxophone nice. tenor saxophone player clarence uh, clemens right clarence clemens man i yeah. mean that when i heard that sound um from clarence clemens i was like i want to learn how to play the saxophone yeah and so that's what i did when i got to middle school and i joined the band and i started with saxophone so mm -hmm. is that uh so when you hit middle school, when did you start uh, getting, actually playing the instrument? Yeah, so I started on alto, like, you know, most kids do. And then I was pretty tall. Um, I was probably around this height. I'm like 5'9", probably in like seventh or eighth grade. And my middle school band director, um, who I absolutely adore, love, she's it for me, um, you know, was like, you're a great musician, you know, we don't have a strong bass section. Do you want to try playing Barry? And I was like, okay. 
Um, and I was really fortunate that my parents were willing to kind of, you know, help me pursue that. Uh, we bought a Naked Lady Con 1952 um, from a widow. So it wasn't actually that expensive. She just wanted it to go to somebody who was going to play it and going to use it and that kind of thing. Um, so I started really playing Barry in like sixth or seventh grade. I played alto and jazz band still. Um, then when I got into high school, it was, you know, full gears on and you know, my senior year, I took uh, like four and a half music classes. I was able to internship with my uh, band director. And um, I just, you know, I knew from like that point on that I wanted to teach music. That was like the one thing that I wanted to do. Um, I'm, I know we've talked about this before, but I definitely wanted to teach like beginning band, like fifth grade beginning band is kind of like what I had dreamed about teaching and I always thought, well, I was really good with kids. So like, obviously that would be a natural fit. Um, and then when I graduated from the University of Rhode Island in 2013 and I got my first job, I was teaching band, but I was also teaching music tech <laughs> and I had no experience in music tech whatsoever. So um, the past 10 years that I've been here, it's just been, you know, learning and growing and research and you know, curriculum editing and revisions. And I, I just, I fell in love with it. So now I teach jazz band after school. I no longer teach band in school. Um, we have a different person for that. Uh, and then I just teach music tech like full time, which is awesome. So, yeah. Yeah, that was in some ways similar to, I, I started off as a high school band director and was a high school band director for 15 years before I became a middle school band director. And all that time in high school, I went to middle school. I thought, how hard can this be? And mm -hmm. I found out very quickly that beginning band and middle school band is a, that's a whole different animal. Yeah. And, but when I went to this school and this is, that was 2011, I'm, I'm still at the same school now they gave me a general music class because at the time we didn't have enough eighth graders to have two sections. And I was just like, Oh man, I, I did not want to do uh, general music. Um, and there, and I let me say, I have colleagues and friends out there that teach general music and they are wonderful. Mm -hmm. I was just not prepared for that. So I ended up getting, uh, so when the students would come see me, we had a PC lab like just around the corner and I just started reserving that PC lab every time my general music students came in and mm -hmm. we would just go on the computers and go, you know, at the time it was like fruity loops mm -hmm. and we would find, you know, anything that we could find that was free because we didn't have anything other mm -hmm. than audacity. We did have, uh, we did get audacity mm -hmm. and I just started kind of making it up because I was just trying to find something that the students would be engaged with and mm -hmm. and they were engaged with that the students that you know they weren't in band they weren't in choir they weren't in orchestra and I, to a large degree i don't think they were really very interested in learning how to read musical notation or learn an instrument but when mm -hmm. they had a chance to start interacting with the music that was really relevant to them it was like oh my gosh they're engaged with this. Mm -hmm. Did you have yeah. a similar? Yeah, absolutely. And I've actually had that conversation with some of my, you know, music colleagues that I work with, um, you know, like what's the final goal of our curriculums, right? Like scope and sequence and backwards design. And, you know, obviously for like beginning guitar and piano and, you know, band and orchestra, um, you know, they all have this notation thread. And I'm like, I don't teach my kids how to read music because they don't need to. They, you know, I can teach music theory by looking at the piano roll, you know, and talking about the space between the notes and relationships that way. Um, you know, I've, I've found that I can be just as successful with that than having kids, you know, this is a G, this is an A, you know, like it's, 
it's not something that they're going to buy into because they probably don't see the end result of it being useful. So I rather start them there, like reading like the piano roll. And then when they are interested and they are hooked into the theory, that's when you can kind of start saying, well, you know, if you want to kind of pursue this further, you know, you can learn how to read music, but you don't have to. Um, so it is a skill that will help you, it won't hurt you, but it is an extra thing that, you know, musicians do, you know, often on the side. So, um, but to be like a, you know, music producer, I know like, like uh, Dead Mouse, right? Who's a famous DJ. He doesn't know how to read music and he's a famous DJ. You know what I mean? Um, so the students based off of like their priorities, um, I don't think necessarily need to read notation. And I know that can be controversial to some music teachers and especially with um, our, you know, college prep programs that um, in my opinion, are very much lacking in the music tech aspect uh, and very much lacking in any other genre other than like Western classical music. Um, so that to me is like a huge like setup basically for music educators that are coming through colleges now is that, you know, these aren't the ways that kids are continuing to make music, they're not interested necessarily in that. Um, and again, thinking about the other 80%, as we call it, I think now it's actually up to 85%, which is terrifying, you know, of a regular student, you know, school population that aren't involved in band, orchestra, or choir. How are you reaching them, right? Because you could have great musicians in that student population but just miss the boat on, you know, being classically trained in your ensemble. Um, so yeah, that's my long answer to that. <laughs> no, I, I don't think it's a, a long answer at all because it's, it's something I've spent a lot of time thinking about and uh, it's, it's, it's a deep hole to start digging into, but I think you're absolutely right because even outside of music, you know, when it comes to, you know, language arts, reading and writing, we have the terms, you know, literate or illiterate. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times that, you know, if you say, well, that person's illiterate, I mean, that has a really negative connotation. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, if you're literate, then, you know, you can have, it's almost like a, a status. And somewhere along the line, it was decided, at least in America, that, to be a literate musician meant that you understood how to read mm -hmm. this quote unquote traditional music notation, because that's what we're taught when we go to university. Right. Mm -hmm. And even music teachers that I've talked to over the years since I've been doing this and, uh, and they say, you know, how am I going to teach music technology? I don't know how to do that. And I'll tell them, I'm like, listen, if you have a music education degree from, probably 95% of the universities and colleges in the United States that grant music education degrees, I can guarantee you don't know how to teach this mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, it becomes, I think it really is seen as it's, you know, almost like a status thing that in, in order to be a respected musician, then you have to be literate and they define literacy as notation, but you can't convince me that, the Beatles were illiterate musicians or that Jimi Hendrix was an illiterate musician. Right. There are other ways to be musically very literate, mm -hmm. but it's how we define it as educators. Right. 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 And especially, you know, the importance, like I said before, of like colleges kind of creating a hierarchy of, you know, like genre importance. Um, I get really frustrated sometimes because I'll have phenomenal students in music tech, um, you know, kind of like aspiring rappers and, you know, they're like, can I major in this in college? And the closest thing that I can usually give them is like, you know, audio production or, you know, music tech, but usually those majors require you to be in an ensemble and these kids don't have a major ensemble instrument, um, you know, unless their keyboarding skills are up to par and they can, you know, play piano, but it's, it's frustrating because I've had 
more than one occasion where this has happened. Um, I actually just had a student, a former student come visit me who was kind of in this boat and he just moved to LA after he graduated and just, you know, starting at like a for-profit, um, you know, like music production school, you know, cause it's like, what, what other, you know, programs in the country offer um, you know, a, a music ed program or a music tech kind of like specialty that doesn't require you to read music, that doesn't require you to play an ensemble instrument. Um, and again, for those students that maybe couldn't afford it, you know, because they grew up in, uh, you know, low socioeconomic pockets, um, you know, they can't afford to rent an instrument in fifth grade or fourth grade or their family can't afford it. So then obviously they're, you know, isolated, uh, you know, into making music a different way. And, you know, again, we shouldn't think of that as like lesser than, or, you know, lower than. Um, I, you know, I think both sets of my students would agree that they can't do what the other one does. You know, my jazz band kids versus, you know, my hip hop music tech kids. Um, so I think they would both acknowledge that they have different uh, kind of like sub interests or uh, sub talent in different areas of music. And that's great. So one of the things I've found in my experience, too, as you talk about those different groups of students is the students are pretty open at really appreciating what the others do. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think kids aren't necessarily conditioned yet you know into this like hierarchy system of what we know right because this is just what it's been um you know we know these you know big colleges or institutions that you know have these uh esteemed programs you know that they, they're still learning that stuff so i don't think that they necessarily they're not as I don't want to use the word brainwashed as we are, but, you know, they're not as familiar with that system yet. Um, I had another student who I'm actually going to post on my podcast soon. Uh, this wonderful senior, our concert master, she is a Brazilian immigrant and she did a whole research project um, in her English class about the term world music. Right. And she interviewed myself, the band director and the orchestra director, talking about exactly this, this idea that we don't incorporate other genres of music, you know, into these music ed preparatory programs. Um, you know, and she's a senior in high school, you know, and she has this perspective and she, you know, gained this all on her own. Um, so it, it just leads me to believe that there are probably more students that you know, have that viewpoint as well. So I was thinking as we're talking about this, one of the things that used to frustrate me somewhat, you know, particularly when I was doing pet band, you know, if we had our pet band at a basketball game or at a football game or whatever, and someone would, you know, from the crowd would, would walk up and go, Hey, play that such and such song. That's, you know, popular on the radio at the time. And it's, it's like, we can't just, play a song like we like we have we have to learn it we have to practice it you know da 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 right. and in some ways i think you know students just hear hip hop they just hear pop you just turn the radio on and out it comes and they don't get to see all the work that went into it right to get to mm -hmm. that point you know i tell my students that you know, anybody that you listen to on the radio, the reason you listen to them is one day they decided they were going to start making music. And on that day, the music they made was probably really, really bad, mm -hmm. but they came back the next day and they worked at it some more. And eventually it wasn't, it wasn't too bad. And then it becomes pretty good. So and my point being that, you know, as like a band or orchestra student, you become familiar with that whole rehearsal process, right? That process of, of what it takes to practice to reach a certain level. And I think even with sports, people probably understand that, you know, really great athletes certainly have athletic talent, but there's a lot of practice and work that goes into getting good. 
And I don't know that we appreciate that so much with the music where we just hit a button on our iPods and the music comes out. So to be able to work with students to go, hey, there is a process to learn how to do this that takes time Mm -hmm. is pretty unique or something that they don't often get to see. I I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that does. And I I think that's a really good point because, um, you know, I have students that I get a little frustrated with sometimes because they have the capacity and they have the skills to keep going essentially. And, you know, my big thing is that, you know, I, I try and allow for creativity and freedom in my classroom um, you know, as much as possible. So, you know, after they're done with their assignment for me, I'm like, you know, just have at it. And, um, you know, some kids get it and, you know, they're off to the races and, you know, creating stuff and, you know, watching tutorials on YouTube and trying to figure out new software programs. Um, but then I have some other kids that, you know, they, they're just like, well, I'm done, you know, and it's just kind of like, like you're saying, we almost have to teach them that this doesn't, you know, happen overnight and that there's a process and that, you know, the more you fail, the more you'll learn and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, because yeah, some, sometimes the students are just kind of like, well, I did my work, so I'm going to sit here on my phone or do my math homework or, you know, it's like, oh, come on, you know, like, so. Yeah. And I, I teach at a middle school, and the music technology course that I teach is, is very introductory. It's beginners. It's one of those that, you know, if they take it and they finally like it when they get to high school, we do have a high school curriculum where they really get to dig deeper. Mm. But the students that I have in my class don't choose to be in the class. They're just assigned, um, unlike like band or orchestra or choir, you know, they can choose to participate. So yeah, so some of my, and I see a lot of students that pass me in the hallway every day. They're like, how can I get in your class? I'm like, I, I, you know, I don't know. So it's, it is kind of random. And so there's definitely a range of how engaged the students may or may not be. And I have mm-hmm. some students that are just, you know, academically very conscientious. So they do the work because, you know, they want to you know, keep really good grades, even though they may not really be interested in doing it. Mm. And I have other students that may not be very successful in their other classes, but they're all stars in my class. And then some that are just like you described, just kind of neither. So where you teach, Mm. are students electing to be in your class or are they assigned? How, how do students get into that program? Yeah. So yes and no. Um, there are definitely students that, you know, are aware of my program and like you're saying, like it's their favorite class. That's why they come to school, you know, not so great of a student necessarily in other classes, but, you know, getting straight A's in my class. Um, And then, you know, there's the other side where, you know, oh, well, you just need an arts elective. You like hip hop, you like music here, take music tech, you know? Um, So I have, it's kind of interesting because there's usually like a combination. So, you know, if you're teaching math or science, you know, you have honors and you have AP and, you know, this kind of like hierarchy of whatever. And, you know, for us, we just get everyone. Um, so really trying to, uh, differentiate instruction and, you know, make sure students are getting the support that they need, uh, you know, extra tutorials or extra help. Um, I also try and encourage kids to collaborate. Uh, I have this thing called freestyle Friday where, um, I actually stole this from Bob Habersat from the shed. So shout out to Bob. Um, so Google has this thing called a passion project where they 20% of their work time goes to a project of their choice. So on Fridays, I give kids the opportunity to work on whatever they want. So if they want to, you know, work with someone in the class on like a podcast, on a playlist, on, you know, creating music together, any, anything of that sort. Um, or they can use that time to, you know, continue to work on whatever project they're working on for my class too. Um, But just to give them like the freedom to kind of, you know, be interactive and 
you know, if they're frustrated with uh, the lack of whatever subject they're not getting in my class, maybe they signed up thinking that we were going to do this only thing and we haven't done that yet. Um, you know, they can continue to kind of explore and um, create freely with that. Uh, they do have to turn in one project a semester to me, uh, you know, via like a Google form. Um, but it's cool because it, it gets students to start to think like, oh, I can do things that, you know, outside of her class, they don't need an assignment to, you know, do something. Um, and I have kids, you know, we use Soundtrap predominantly because, um, again, Music Tech One for me is very introductory as well. And uh, I have kids that have like, you know, projects and projects and projects, you know, scroll through like 50 something projects, you know, um, you know, whether it's just like starting something or collaborating with somebody or whatever. So it's kind of a mixed bag. It's definitely like I have some kids that, you know, are all in and then I have other kids that are like, this is hard. <laughs> You know, and I'm like, who said music was easy? You know, I hear so. that a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it's amazing. It's it's pretty impossible to escape the bell shaped curve, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, almost anywhere you go, uh, you know, that's going to happen. So, I, I want to back up a little bit just to tell me a little bit more about because when you started teaching this, there there was no curriculum and you created you know the own the curriculum that you started so mm -hmm. I'm just curious to know like how did that happen like what was the class called initially what led you to go hey why don't we try this yeah so when I first got here there was kind of like bits and pieces that were um kind of cemented, you know, some a project here, like a podcast project or, you know, a melody project, but it wasn't like given to me specifically. It wasn't, um, here's the music tech curriculum, right? So I basically kind of just started from scratch um, because, you know, I wanted it to be sequential. I wanted there to be skills that, you know, built upon other projects. Um, and I also wanted to make sure that students were engaged with the content too. Um, so I decided to take like the genre route. Um, so I did like a little bit of like music history and music making. So uh, like the first project kids make is like a basic like binary, you know, AB form project and soundtrack. Um, and then I start with uh, indigenous folk music. I, uh, and then connect it to electronic music. So I'm trying to show them that there's a connection between, you know, music way, way back and even today's music. And then we kind of work our way forward. And every week they get a new genre uh, to kind of explore. I have like a worksheet that they get. And um, on my Google Classroom, they have like set examples that they can pick from, or if they're familiar with the genre, they can pick you know, whatever song they want, but it has to be from that genre. Um, you know, and then we talk about it, maybe have some, you know, different videos, some handouts, that kind of thing that they explore. Um, but it's really interesting because I think the music history aspect and like the genre aspect actually gets kids to think more about how music can be expression and a perspective. Um, and I think that that's, really what we want to ultimately teach, right, is that music is a form of expression. Um, you know, we can use it for social emotional needs, you know, that kind of thing. And I don't think that that's necessarily talked about enough, um, you know, that we can learn about other cultures, like through music, right? It's always like, this is our repertoire, this is what we're playing, you know, it's a grade three or whatever, you know. Um, so, and then I just kind of started building from there. So again, like basic form projects. And then I have uh, what I call my hip hop unit, which I start with like a podcast kind of format. I call it the DNA project. Um, and students pick four of their favorite songs to kind of talk about 
but they have to like, you know, is there a guitar solo? Is there, you know, a feature? Is there a rapper on a pop song? You know, that kind of thing. So they have to t- like, kind of like uh, analyze the song in addition to, um, you know, explaining why they chose the song and why it's important to them. Um, and this shows kids like how to download music, how to import music on a soundtrack. Um, and then we go from that to sampling. Obviously sampling is like, you know, a pretty frequently used music technique uh, in hip hop especially, but even in the pop world you see today. And, uh, and then we have a hip hop instrumental, which I only do with my upperclassmen. I don't do with my eighth graders. My school's an eight twelve school. Um, so the eighth graders have like a semester course and my nine twelve kids, I have them all year. So, which is awesome. Um, I don't know of a lot of music tech programs that aren't semesterized. So I'm very fortunate to have that. Um, and then, yeah, so the hip hop instrumental, which forces the kids not to use loops. So they have to create it all on their own. And this is really where we kind of dive into like scales and a little bit of theory. So they kind of understand that concept and some basic rhythms. Um, And then I have the social justice project, which they kind of, you know, are combining all of those things that they've learned so far. So I'm like, okay, you get loops back, but you don't have to use them if you don't want to. They're creating a song, uh, you know, with a distinct form. They're writing lyrics for the first time about a selected uh, social justice topic of their choice. Um, They're advocating for that topic. And then we do uh, some collaboration stuff with the art department. You know, they get assigned like a picture and um, students have to create a song that goes along with the picture and it's displayed at the art show in the spring concert. Uh, And then we do like a movie unit to end the year. So again, trying to hit on a lot of different things in music. So like podcasting, songwriting, you know, basic form, movie stuff, you know, film scoring, just to kind of give them like, this is what you can do with music tech, you know. Um, But I I also found that the, again, the history aspect and the genre aspect um, led me kind of more into the hip hop realm, because I always had students asking me, you know, when are we going to do hip hop? When are we going to do hip hop? Um, Especially my first like year or two, because I was like, oh, we'll get to it, you know kind of like kicking the can down the road, so to speak. Um, So that was really, I think the first for me, kind of like me realizing like, oh, I can teach this, you know, like it wasn't really presented to me in an academic way prior to that. Um, And then when I started my master's degree at Columbia at Teachers College, um, that was definitely kind of explored a little bit more. And I was like, okay, I understand that I can actually present this in an academic setting, get the kids, you know, more interested and actually teach them, you know, a thing or two about the history of hip hop, um, about, you know, basic like trap rhythms, you know, hi-hat alternating patterns and, you know, 808 bass and like that kind of thing. Um, And I I think that kind of started driving me to think that there's more here, that I can do a lot more um, with kind of gaining the interests of my students. So I actually created uh, a hip hop course on its own, um, in addition to music tech, and we call it hip hop influences and trends. And it's kind of like my music tech class, except it's only focused on hip hop. So all the subgenres and stuff that we do, I do like, um, I call them the foundational genres. So blues, jazz, gospel, that kind of thing. But then we get to, you know, gangster rap and trap and drill and crunk. And, you know, each of those is a different week. And I've had to, you know, do a lot of research, watch a lot of videos, read a lot of articles, trying to pull from different resources, um, you know, different interviews from artists that I can show my kids to kind of say, okay, this is 
the musical characteristics we have in this, you know, subgenre of hip hop. Um, these are some of the artists, you know, again, just kind of like quick things that they can pull away and say, okay, this is a drill artist, you know, drill came from Chicago, London, and New York, and, you know, just kind of like quick facts. Um, and if they are interested more in a particular genre and like learning how to make it, um, you know, they can explore that more because they also have the Freestyle Friday um, opportunity. So yeah, it's, <laughs> sorry, that was a really long answer, but I'm just trying to give you like the scope of all of my thinking in the last 10 years. Um, but yeah, so I, I think I think the interest of the students is really what drives my curriculum. I really try and focus on like what my students are interested in. Um, and you kind of like gain this trust, you know, by doing that. Um, like, oh, she's gonna talk about, you know, Meek Mill, or she's gonna talk about Dr. Dre and, you know, that kind of thing. And the kids are, you know, instantly like, oh, I didn't know that I could, you know, talk about this or write music like this seriously, you know, in an academic setting. So, yeah. No, that it's, I'm enjoying so much, you know, hearing you talk about these things. Cause again, there are a lot of parallels with my experience, you know, here and where I live in Georgia, I'm in Gwinnett County, which is considered a suburb of Atlanta. Um, so Atlanta is encircled by uh, 285, which is like the perimeter. So Gwinnett is like the first county outside of the perimeter. But Gwinnett's a huge county. We have close to uh, almost a million people in the county. Our school system is huge. Uh, we have over 180,000 students in our school system, wow. you know, 24 high schools, you know, tons. The other thing about Gwinnett is we're the most diverse county in the state of Georgia mm. when it comes to, uh, uh, you know, ethnicity, people that come from a lot of different countries, nationalities. It's a really diverse county. And, you know, one of the things, when I started moving into hip hop, because I, I thought, again, it was something that my students are going to be engaged with, right? Mm -hmm. But if I was going to teach it, I needed to learn about it too and I can remember like when I was in my middle school high school years were uh, basically the 80s right mm. so and I can remember in the 80s when hip-hop really became began to become mainstream so uh, you know I, I can remember listening to Run DMC and there was a group called the Fat Boys that uh, mm -hmm. I, uh, you know I related to and uh, you know Public Enemy and WA you know, MC Hammer, all these things, uh, you know, all these artists that that develop. But then when I started to really dig into learning about the cultural roots of hip hop and where it came from in the 70s and in the Bronx, it was like, okay, uh, this is, at least for me, I thought this is really important for my students to understand mm -hmm. where this came from, because a lot of it came you know, if you think about the 70s in New York City, you had Studio 54, which was basically disco, lifestyles of the rich and famous, you know, money, celebrities everywhere, where at the same time in like the Bronx, uh, you know, the Bronx was literally on fire. Mm -hmm. And you start learning about these things. Well, you know, why did this happen? Well, you know, there were these decisions made uh, when it came to like funding in the city and public services were cut. And the first things they cut were education budgets and like the fire department. So why was the Bronx on fire? Because literally they were getting, they were cutting the fire department staff. So when there were fires, there was no one to put them out. And, you know, someone brought up that you know, public schools in the Bronx, there there were no music programs, or at least they didn't have instruments. Right. Um, you know, they didn't have, you know, trumpets or drums or, or whatever, but they did what humans have always done, which is 
created an instrument from whatever they had to use, which at the time was a turntable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to learn, like to, to, to see interviews and I'll, I'll mention too, and I'll put some links in the show notes, but uh, the rock and roll hall of fame uh, has some great resources. Uh, rock, rock hall, Dot org, I think is the website, but if you do edu.rockhall.org, it's education resources that are great. And then another one that I found that's been fantastic is teachrock.org. Mm -hmm. They have great resources. And, but, you know, to see like um, Grandmaster Flash that not only had developed a turntable as an instrument, but developed a technique that you practice and you had to learn to play the instrument like you would a violin or a saxophone mm -hmm. is is really important because it's a history that's not really often included in our public school curriculum right but i will also say that just with my students that there was i guess a little bit of self-consciousness kind of developed mm -hmm. or i would start talking to it and my students would kind of lean forward and like what do you know about hip-hop Mm -hmm. uh, and then, but then I would start, you know, sharing, you know, information with them and, and they're like, okay. Um, but, but yeah, it, it's, I don't know, it's kind of tricky to um, cross that border. I'm not even quite sure exactly how I'm trying to say it, but you know, what, yeah. what is, what is your student population like? What has your experience been as far as you know, digging into some of those historical and, and cultural issues of, you know, teaching that genre of music. Yeah, so it's very interesting. Hyannis is a very interesting place. <laughs> um, because, you know, when I tell people that I'm from the Cape and, you know, Cape Cod, they usually think about the Kennedys and, you know, hydrangeas and white picket fences and the beach. And there definitely is that here. You know, there that's definitely a thing. However, um, there's also a big population that has to wait on those people, right? So um, I grew up in Brewster, which is a little bit further out on the Cape, and definitely the further out on the Cape, the joke is the whiter it gets, right? Um, so in Hyannis is kind of like the middle center of the Cape. Um, there's a big population of uh, Brazilian immigrants. There's a big population of Jamaican immigrants and a growing population of Central American immigrants um, to a point where I think when I first started teaching here, I think it was like maybe 80 something percent white. Um, and now it's actually down in the higher 50s um, because one, I think it's about a third of our students uh, actually don't speak English as their first language at home. So, you know, obviously that includes the LLL students, but that also includes, you know, FLEP students or students that are proficient in English, but, you know, their parents speak Portuguese or Spanish to them at home. Um, so it, it's really interesting because, you know, being a public school teacher, you definitely have this kind of like span of kids where, you know, mommy and daddy are on a yacht for the weekend next to a kid that could be homeless, um, you know, and kind of how do you, uh, again, kind of um, balance that out, I guess, or address those different issues uh, to kids that maybe that's never been a problem for them, or they're just really naive and don't understand that, you know, some families have it, you know, more difficult than others. Um, for me, I know that like I present hip hop kind of like you're saying, like the history aspect, um, you know, and I always tell them like, you guys are the pros when it comes to like hip hop today, you know? Um, so I always try and phrase it like, you're going to teach me and I'm going to teach you, right? I'm going to teach you more of the history, um, you know, more of the roots. And then you guys are going to teach me, you know, who's your favorite artist, what's hot right now, you know, who's got the big feature on the number one song on the charts or whatever. Um, and with that, I've kind of grown like a pretty organic relationship with of trust between my students. Um, I also have this segment and I, and I saved it more for my music tech two kids. Cause I actually, I do offer a music tech two class as well. Um, it's really corny. <laughs> 
It's called Hip Hop Honor with O'Connor. Oh, I like and, it. Yeah. And um, what it is basically is kids submit songs for deep analysis. So they'll like, for example, I had a student submit Pyramids by Frank Ocean once, right? So I then, you know, go on Genius, which has an awesome, uh, you know, lyric website that, you know, kind of presents like some of the history and context of the lyrics. Um, I go on whosampled.com, which you can see if a song is sampled. Um, I go on Tracklib, which is kind of the same thing. I go, you know, YouTube to see if there's any interviews with the artists about the song. I do like deep analysis. Like usually it takes me about two hours to like get through like one of these songs. And then traditionally, usually on Fridays, um, you know, I present my understanding of it. And the kids are like, wow, she's really taking the time to like look at my music and teach me a thing or two, you know, if there's like different production techniques or, um, you know, sometimes the kids don't even take the time to like really look at the lyrics, like they just like the song or like you're saying it's like on the radio or whatever. Um, so like going through the lyrics and like looking at different rhyming schemes or looking at, you know, similes or metaphors and like really looking at it more from like an English, like kind of analytical perspective. Um, I think the kids start to appreciate like different lyric lyricists in that regard as well. Um, so yeah, I, I think just like gaining that trust of like, I see you and I appreciate your music and, you know, I'm not like, oh, that's, you know, we're not going to study that here. You know, I actually say quite the opposite to the kids when they first come to the high school is that you know, I don't even have like classical music in my curriculum because I'm like, you guys have done that, <laughs> you know, all throughout elementary school and middle school, like, you know, so we're, we're going to move on with that. Um, and the other thing that I do, um, and I think about Chris Emden's book a lot um, for white folks that teach in the hood and the rest of y'all too. Uh, it's a great read because he kind of gives like different techniques of like how to connect uh, with different populations of students. Um, and one of the things that he talks about is like sneakers, right? Uh, a lot of kids, you know, are very much into, you know, buying sneakers, Air Jordans, whatever. Um, I, I'm more of a Converse girl myself. Uh, so that's kind of what I sport, but um, I do, I wear music shirts a lot, like all the time. And kids know that you know, I usually have some sort of artist on my shirt. And um, again, on Fridays, I do a lot on Friday. <laughs> um, I have this thing called Music T-Shirt Friday, where I usually like, you know, spotlight an artist for like 10 minutes. Um, so, you know, I have everyone from like Britney Spears, you know, today I'm wearing Tyler, the creator. Um, what else do I got? System of a Down. I try and like, you know, really hit a span of different genres, but I definitely have more hip hop shirts. So I think I have like two Tupac shirts. I have a Biggie shirt, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So. Your, your t-shirt game is strong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I think just again, like validating the students, you know, like, oh, what do you listen to? Like, let me listen to that. Oh, I really like this, that, and the other thing. And being able to kind of gain their trust, I think is kind of like my way of trying to connect with kids. And, and um, you know, even at a conference, it was actually at um, Massachusetts All State a few years ago, I presented about my uh, hip hop course and I had somebody come up to me afterwards saying that I presented very white. And I was like, yes, because I am. <laughs> I'm not trying to be something that I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to appropriate culture. I'm not, you know, I'm trying to be genuinely myself and I'm just trying to like build relationships with kids, you know? So I think that's also a big thing that a lot of people, like you're saying, are kind of afraid of, um, you know, well, you know, I'm white and, you know, my students aren't and how do I, you know, and it's like, if you 
you know, uh, are able to connect with the students, you know, and validate, um, you know, again, like what they're listening to and what they're making, you know, it's all about relationship building. And I think that that's really kind of the alley way to make that connection, you know? Yeah. You've, you've mentioned a couple of times about having trust with students. And I think that trust is really important where, you know, they'll, they know, they will, will figure out pretty quickly if, you know, you're sincere or, or not. Right. And one of the things that I've used over the last couple of years, and because one of the things I'll say to my students is, have you ever had the sensation that, you know, you want to look at your mom or a teacher or somebody and go, you know, I'm trying to say something, but you're just not listening to me. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I went, well, you know, music can be a really good way to get people to listen to what you have to say. And we'll talk about uh, how music has been used. It's, uh, I, I think I've sort of borrowed it from uh, a lesson activity in uh, teachrock.org called Songs of Protest. Mm-hmm. But without telling them what it is, I'll show them to, I'll show them the lyrics to a song called For What It's Worth, uh, which is late 60s. I think it was oh, Buffalo Springfield was the artist maybe. But I'll show them the lyrics and, you know, one of the, the verses, you know, goes, what a field day for the heat, a thousand people in the street, singing songs, carrying signs, most of them say hooray for our side. And I'll go, what does that sound like? Like what's happening? Mm-hmm. You know, and, you know, particularly in the last couple of years or, you know, a couple of years ago, they're like, oh, there are people protesting in the street and i'm like yeah where have you seen that and you know particularly here in georgia in savannah which is a couple hours away but several years ago we had ahmaud aubrey who was uh, a young african-american who was uh, shot jogging through a neighborhood Um, Mm -hmm. and you know you have ferguson missouri that was going on and george floyd in minnesota so that you know while covid was going on we suddenly had this big, you know, Black Lives Matter movement. And, you know, here in Atlanta, they shut down the interstate. They were protesting, you know, in downtown Atlanta. And so they read those lyrics and they recognize, oh, yeah, that's what that is. And and then I'll tell them, well, this song was actually written in the late 60s and they were protesting also. But at the time, they what they were protesting was the Vietnam War. And you know, we'll go, you know, through those lyrics and talk about, um, you know, how as much as we like to think that society is moving forward, it seems like we're fighting a lot of the, you know, the same battles. And, Mm -hmm. but we'll go back and use, you know, even as we talk about, you know, early hip hop, or at least early commercial hip hop, uh, probably the first uh, well-known song was the one called Rapper's Delight. Uh, by the Sugar Hill Gang, which was just like a fun, you know, party kind of tune. You know, early hip hop was not serious music, right? Mm -hmm. But then we get into the middle 80s and Public Enemy comes along. And Public Enemy is suddenly talking about political things, about what's happening, um, you know, culturally and politically. And just as they think, you know, Public Enemy is, you know, really hard then here well here comes nwa which is you know takes it to another level and i'll even take that back you know into the 60s and 70s where you have you know james brown say it loud i'm black and i'm proud that's you know at the height you know coming out of the civil rights movement um, you know and going into the 70s where then you have curtis mayfield singing freddie's dead that's now basically about how you know that African-American culture in New York City is ruining in itself because of, you know, this rising, um, you know, drug abuse and drug trade that happens in the 70s. And, but I find that, you know, for my students, it's when I start to relate it back to, you know, this is really important music. Like this is really important commentary on what was going on at the time. What, what is it that you have to say about what's going on here? But at the same time, you know, they still know that music 
can be used for that, but music can also just be for fun. Mm -hmm. um, you know, well, like I'll use party rock anthem as, you know, or the most ridiculous, dumbest song ever that was wildly popular. What does the Fox say? And uh, <laughs> we'll go over, we'll go over the lyrics to that. And I'm like, I'm like, who comes up with this? But it was, right. you know, but I said, but as soon as I said it, that song popped in your head. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, yeah, I think when, at least for me, when I'm able to, you know, show them some real examples and, and to go, you know, what do you want to say? Mm -hmm. um, you know, that they begin, more of them at least really begin to lock in and start going, well, you know what? I do have something to say. Mm. Yeah. That's, that's fantastic because like I, I said earlier, you know, I have a social justice project that, you know, is kind of along the same idea. Um, and I usually give this students like a list of different topics. Um, but I'm always like, you know, if you have a topic that you want to, you know, do that's not on this list, just come talk to me, you know? Um, and, you know, racism and discrimination are two of the most popular topics that usually get picked. Um, I would say bullying behind that um, because, you know, again, I think the students, you know, see that day to day uh, and then LGBTQ rights, you know, that's another topic that um, I think my students see, you know, a lot of, you know, awful things happening to that community, um, sadly. Uh, so with that, I think that, um, you know, being able to connect, like you're saying, like, what do you have to say? Um, is really powerful. Um, I also, I journal with my kids. And one of the questions that I ask them usually at the end is like, what level of like listening intent are you having with this song? So like you're saying, like, you know, you can have songs kind of like in the background, like that party, whatever, or you can have songs that, you know, kind of capture, you know, your entire attention because you're listening to the lyrics and you know, this really intense, you know, harmony or whatever. Um, and usually I think my kids, uh, again, kind of hover around, like you're saying, like, oh, I'm doing homework and I'm listening to whatever in the background, you know. Um, but, you know, once in a while they'll circle the, you know, more intense option. So, yeah, I, I think that's great. So we've got, um, gosh, I can't believe how fast time goes by because uh, the this conversation has been awesome. And uh, again, I really appreciate you taking uh, some time to talk to me, particularly because y'all are still in school for another couple of <laughs> weeks, right? Yeah. So yeah. I, I'm I'm enjoying some uh, uh, here in the South. We we get out a little bit earlier, but I did want to uh, ask about because one of the things if there are people out there that are interested in seeing your curriculum and what you're doing. One of the things that's really awesome is that Music First, which is a, a, a cloud-based platform for, uh, and Music First is really, or I'd say Music First Classroom is really designed to deliver uh, instructional materials and resources really for performance-based classes like band, choir, and orchestra. But one of the things that they've done is that you want one of your units that you created for hip hop music is available on Music First Classroom, correct? Yes. Actually, as this past summer, I actually have two uh, curriculum units now on Music First. Um, so the first one, like you're referencing, is the hip hop unit. And that was that, um, that grouping of projects that I explained earlier with the DNA project and the instrumental and sampling and all that. So there are step-by-step -step instructions, you know, it's almost like you're in my like Google classroom, essentially that, you know, there's rubrics and um, uh, different um, examples to watch and different videos and tutorials and that kind of thing. Um, Music First is great because like you're saying the classroom aspect of it, if you are somebody that isn't comfortable with, you know, diving into whatever genre, you can go on Music First, um, the content library and search for whatever artist, topic, genre, whatever. Um, and, you know, their library is growing every day. 
Um, so my first, the hip hop unit was posted in 2016. And then uh, u.dj, which is a really cool website um, that it's basically like an online DJ setup. Um, Jim Frankel uh, got a hold of this and was like, we need to, you know, create something around this. So he reached out to me, which I was, you know, really honored. Um, and he said, you know, can we create some kind of like DJ unit for this? So that's what I did last summer, um, where we cover, you know, dub, hip hop, house, techno, um, you know, we're talking about like LGBTQ history, definitely in house music, right? Uh, uh, dubstep, EDM, and um, what's the last one? I think I said techno already. But anyway, so that's another unit that um, people can check out as well on Music First. Um, you know, Music First is a, a subs subscription uh, based off of like per student. Um, but it is, like I said, very powerful in the sense that you get lessons and you get, you know, you can kind of shop a la carte what you want for attachments. So you can get Soundtrap, you can get Note Flight, you know, you can get Aurelia, a bunch of different things that you can kind of package together for your classroom in particular. Um, I also have a website. So if people are like, oh, I, you know, I don't have the funding or whatever, uh, they can check out musicoconnor.com and at least my rubrics are there. Um, so people can kind of start, you know, thinking about, well, maybe I'll try this project and uh, there are tutorials posted on there too, uh, video tutorials that I saved from COVID um, of like me just giving directions to my kids. So obviously it's kind of like me walking you through the materials that I usually use. So that's definitely something to check out too. Cool. Yeah. And we'll make sure to put the links to some of these in the program notes. So, well, to wrap up, I have a few questions that I usually kind of do with uh, all of our podcast guests just to kind of uh, bring things to an end. So the, the first question uh, I'll ask is if you had a crystal ball and you could look into it to see into the future, you know, how do you think music education is going to look five, 10, 15 years down the road? I would like to be optimistic <laughs> and say that it would, you know, reflect, um, what kids are learning about in school will reflect what they're listening to at home. Unfortunately, though, um, you know, again, looking at college, you know, academia as an example, I mean, jazz isn't even a, an intricate part of most music ed curriculum. And, you know, that was even further long ago. So I, I feel really strongly that people will be pressured to do that just because of the industry. Um, but, you know, will it happen in the next like 10, 15 years? I hope so, because, you know, like I said, this is my 10th year and of teaching, you know, and at this school. So I hope to see, you know, more growth and more change um, happen, but I don't know. We'll see. I mean, hip hop surpassing rock was it 2017, right? Um, I, I think that definitely spoke volumes to a lot of people that, you know, thought that hip hop was never gonna become that popular. Um, you know, Bad Bunny is the number one streamed artist on Spotify three years in a row now. You know, it's it's crazy. Um, so yeah, I would I would hope that more people would be open and interested in learning, um, you know, how to teach hip hop, how to teach music tech, seeing more schools offer that, especially, you know, high school, middle school level. Um, and then, you know, maybe having that reflect upward into academia a little bit more. I know there are a couple programs in the country that kind of do that. Um, but, you know, for all of these students that are interested in pursuing that really needs to be more than that. So. Yeah. So the, the crystal ball question kind of leads into the next question, which is kind of the magic wand question or the if you 
you know, had the infinity stones and could snap your finger and make it happen, what would that be? Yeah, I, I definitely think I would try and offer, you know, some kind of program for students that are interested in making a living off of this. And, um, you know, whether that's going to college or some kind of, you know, trade program, you know, doing like audio stuff. Um, I think that that has to be more uh, supported by music educators. Like, I know that there are programs out there, but we don't necessarily know about them, you know? Um, and I think that as music educators kind of, you know, evolve, we kind of see hopefully a shift in, you know, this hierarchy of importance of music. Um, I think that would be my big wish. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I like that one too. So, and finally, just to wrap up, if, you know, for any teacher, but, you know, particularly, you know, even younger teachers, you know, is there, what advice or encouragement would you offer to anyone that's thinking about, uh, you know, either moving into the music ed or becoming a music teacher uh, specifically, or just if they're thinking about adding music tech, kind of what encouragement could you give? Um, the internet is a wonderful place. <laughs> And there are so many resources and teachers that are willing to help, willing to give. Like, again, if you go on my website, I don't charge anyone for anything because I genuinely want people to have access to these things. Um, you know, if we want change, we got to... <laughs> be able to support each other and being able to, to do that. Um, and I, I feel like people don't talk about failure enough amongst teachers, right? That, you know, sometimes you're going to teach a lesson and it's not going to be so great, you know, and you have to go back and kind of revive it. And it's okay to fail once in a while. And I know that diving into a genre that maybe you're not as familiar with might be scary, but, you know, again, if you are genuine and you're transparent with your students about, you know, the, your process and your perspective, um, I think that they'll definitely be more understanding than one would think. Because kids are, I think, naturally very forgiving in that regard so yeah yes yeah. for sure well megan again thank you so much for your time I've, I've enjoyed the conversation so much there's so many more things i want to ask so <laughs> we may have to before too long do this again and, and yeah and, sure. and follow up with that so but uh best of luck to you finishing out yes. uh this year i hope you have a wonderful summer and uh i'm, I'm sure we'll be talking again in the future sounds great thanks for having me if you want to learn more about Megan or check out some of the resources mentioned in the conversation, just look in the notes of this episode and you'll find links to all of these resources. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please subscribe, share with your friends and leave a positive review. Subscribing and leaving positive reviews is one of the most effective ways you can support the channel uh, and help continue and grow the work that I'm doing uh, for teachers in music technology. I hope you'll be on the lookout for the next episode where I'll be having a conversation with Mike Walsh. After a long and very successful career as a high school band director, Mike created a new and innovative audio engineering and production program at his high school in Alpharetta, Georgia. His program has garnered attention from music industry professionals in Georgia and is preparing students to enter into the rapidly expanding music industry in their state. Until next time, I wish you the very best of luck. And this has been Heath from the Music Technology Teacher Network. Advocate, support, inspire, and create.